Now you can be able to share. Okay, let me try to share. Okay. So I don't know if everybody can see my screen now. I want to try to... Yes, they can. To make it full screen. Oh, okay, thank you so much. I want to appreciate all the colleagues who have found time to be in this uh, meeting today. I hope uh, the knowledge that will be shared by Dr. Kamaki and everyone else will uh, add value to all of you who are practicing out there and all of you are in different uh, areas. So first of all, I would like also to appreciate uh, some of my colleagues from uh, Boringa Engelheim, Dr. David Chemir, Mir, William Apollo, and also some of the colleagues from our distributor medicine Kenya Limited, like uh, Joel Ruto and also Dr. Omai. So I would like to go straight into my uh, presentation for today. And uh, before I go into my presentation, I would like to just share a little bit about uh, Boringa Engelheim. So Boringa Engelheim is one of the largest animal health companies globally. We are actually the second largest animal health company in the world. And uh, we are quite committed to working with uh, professionals. That is why uh, for the whole of this year, the last year, 2017, 2016, we have been working very closely with KVA in terms also of uh, giving support and sponsorship during uh, such events like what we are doing today. So in terms of the business that we do, we are actually a commercial company in a, a commercialization of uh, animal health business. We are the global leader in uh, pet parasiticides in terms of uh, control of uh, uh, parasites in uh, companion animals. Some of you will remember Frontline. This is uh, one of our products. And also Rabicin and uh, several other areas. We are also a market leader in uh, several other species. So we are quite committed in terms of uh, animal health and uh, working with professionals. So for the region that uh, we are working in, I said we are a global company, but myself and uh, my colleagues, we are based in Nairobi and we are working in uh, Southern African countries, uh, Southern Africa countries, like the Sadek region and also East Africa countries, but all of us are uh, working from Nairobi. So I'm the key account manager for this region and uh, we are also working together with uh, some of my colleagues who are in this uh, webinar today. So I want to go straight to one of the products that we discussed that those of you have attended the webinars before. I, I informed it says one slide about this product just to share information with some of the colleagues who are in the uh, companion animal business. Is that uh, now we have a product registered by VMD for control of fleas and ticks in uh, dogs only. So this is a product called NextGuard. And the molecule, as you said last time, is uh, afoxolana. So afoxolana is a newer caricide. We are now we have now developed and commercialized it in terms of uh, control of ticks and fleas for dogs. In future, we are looking at commercializing also to other species, but normally we start with the non-food animals, and this is uh, the companion animals. So next card has been registered in Kenya by uh, VMD. It's a file label from our distributor medicine. And just to give a short explanation about this product, because it's a new product, we are required even by uh, the authorities to share information on, uh, on any new products. As I said, for you, uh, colleagues, you need to know everything, starting from the active. So I said the active is a foxolana, which you can see the spelling on the screen. And this is a new molecule uh, for tick and flea control in the world. You remember, it's not easy to come by new molecules. This one of them, which uh, after a lot of research, yeah, we have come up with a new molecule. And the idea now is to use it uh, responsibly to avoid uh, issues of resistance. So the name of the molecule is afoxolana. The brand name that you'll find in, in the market is NextGuard. And it's a chewable tablet. It's a small tablet that uh, you give your dog. It's uh, a meaty flavor. So the dog will really very quickly swallow it. And once the dog uh, swallows this tablet, it will clear a fleece within uh, eight hours. And it will clear all the ticks within uh, 24 hours. And the period of protection is one month. So it will keep killing uh, fleas and ticks for the full one month. So that is in short, uh, next guard. It's now available in Kenya. And it's one of the key products that we use now going forward. Because uh, as a new molecule, there's no resistance. You can use it to clear fleas that are resistant to all sorts of things. And also to, uh, to clear ticks also that could be 
that uh, may be tolerant or resistant to all sorts of uh, molecules out there. So that's the product that we call NextGuard, and it's available from Medicel. I'll give you uh, the context of Medicel later. And uh, it's one of the best products for those of you who are practicing in combined animal for control of fleas and ticks. The number two, most of you will know uh, Rabicin. We have just come in September from the World Rabies Day, even though uh, because of the COVID challenges in uh, this year, we were not able to do a lot. But the idea is just uh, to keep sharing information with pet owners because we know rabies is a major killer in our country. It still kills a lot of their children because the children are very close to their dogs. Even as we speak now, children are playing with their dogs out there. And the idea is, uh, so those of you go out to vaccinate their dogs, is that the cost of uh, going out there and catching the dogs and vaccinating them is quite high. So most of the time you want to go out there with a vaccine that you're sure will give a uh, protection that will confer immunity or immunization to the dogs once um, you have captured them in the field and you're vaccinated. So the idea then is to use quality products because there's no point to go out there and get dogs and then uh, vaccinate them with a poor quality product and not, and not get any zero conversion. So Rabicin is one of the products that has been in the market in Kenya for long. It's also been used by county governments, by uh, private clinics. And this is one of the products that gives actually almost 100% zero conversion, about 97%. While there are so many other products out there which uh, give even 50% uh, or 70% this kind of things. So this is really important. And when I say 97% zero conversion, it means uh, for every 100 dogs that you capture in the field and uh, vaccinate with uh, rabicin, you will get 97 and above of them uh, having seroconfession and having actually antibodies to protect them against rabies. And this is really important. So the other item I wanted to share with you before uh, Dr. Kamaki starts his presentation is about, again, a new uh, product that we have uh, registered with VMD again in Kenya. And this is just a tablet for control of uh, hypocalcemia or milk fever in daily cattle. So it is a daily veterinarian uh, product. <clears throat> One of uh, my passions and my practice also has been in daily. I've uh, worked actually in uh, daily farms even in the Middle East for some time. So it is one of my areas of interest. And you'll find that uh, in daily farms, especially where animals are housed, or where production of milk is very high, most of the daily cattle there that are more than uh, lactation one or uh, lactation three, lactation four, even to lactation five and above, will be very much more susceptible to milk fever than the havers. So there are two approaches to it. You can find uh, an animal that's already down with milk fever. In that case, you need IV calcium to bring it up. But the best way that you would recommend is to identify the susceptible animals. Is that the high producers? Is that the old animals above lactation 3, lactation 4, lactation 5 onwards? and to give them a calcium supplement just at the point of calving. So that this animal, uh, the blood is full of calcium and there's no chance of the animal like, going down. So this is the concept of uh, this product, which we are calling a uh, Bofikalc, is that uh, it's a calcium supplement which you give at the point of calving, just when the animal is calving at that point, or maybe 30 minutes before, maybe 30 minutes after, but just around the calving time. So you give one tablet and it floods the whole body with the uh, uh, available calcium. So if the animal is uh, having any challenges maintaining uh, calcium balance in the body, you will find that will be eliminated and the animal will not go down. So we know that the calcium uh, depression at, at calving is uh, for up to the next uh, 13 hours. So from calving for that, uh, up to the 13 hours that is after calving, the animal will be quite susceptible to milk fever. So you can have this kind of tablet, you give it at calving and then uh, at 12 hours again, you repeat with another tablet. So in that manner, the animal will not go down with, uh, with milk fever. So as they say, prevention is better than cure. So this is what we recommend. We highly recommend that uh, instead of waiting for the daily animals to go down with milk fever and then trying to bring them up, we know uh, bringing up or down a cow with so down with milk fever is not easy. Some animals will, will respond, some will come up and go down again, and this kind of challenges. I know also we are practicing in the field of uh, seeing this kind of uh, challenges. So that is a new uh, product also. It's also available for our distributors, Medicel, and also an, we, are, we also have a second distributor called PKV Supplies. So these are the people who are importing this product and, uh, and, and, 
and, and, and selling it in the country. And it's really one of the important products. So I just want to go ahead to what I plan to share briefly today. I don't know how many minutes I still have uh, Dr. Momani, and we have uh, Dr. Kamagiridi. Yes, you can finish up, it's okay. Okay, okay, thank you so much. So I wanted to finish up with another new molecule. And the new molecule that I want to finish up with is, uh, is a molecule called the prenomectin. So this is, uh, again, a new molecule that we have registered in the country. And uh, this is a poiron. So the prenomectin, we have registered uh, the brand name as Aprinex. This is the uh, brand that is supplied by Boringa Ingerheim. So Aprinex, again, is a product for use in uh, parasite control. So this is a parasite control molecule. It's not a new molecule really in the world. It's been used for more than 15 years in Europe, in the US, in uh, South Africa, and all these countries. But in our country, we just registered it, I think, uh, in 2019. So this molecule is for control of external and internal parasites. So by external parasites, I mean uh, uh, just a range of external parasites, including I'll share tip on this. So the external parasites are not uh, really the focus, but we have uh, wobbles, we have also mince mites and also lice, and this is what is on the label of the product. And it's also for control of internal parasites. Internal parasites, I mean the whole range of internal parasites. This is a, a high uh, broad spectrum molecule, so it will cover a wide range of uh, internal parasites, except of course we know um, liver flux, the whole range of liver flux again needs still uh, products for nitroxamine. We also know tapeworms need special tapeworm uh, products to control. But everything else, the major species of strategia and all this is uh, fully controlled by Eprinex. So just to give uh, an overview of Eprinex, is that it's a potent uh, uh, molecule. So it will clear external parasites and internal parasites for a period of 21 days where there are no parasites. And then uh, Normally, this is for every three month application because we are in a tropical country where we, the whole year is warm and the parasite challenge is consistent. So, it, just like every other day, warmer, you repeat the application once in three months. And uh, during this period of three months, you, you are, you are, you are, you are, your daily cow is safe uh, for many parasites, internal parasites, and some of the external parasites, as I mentioned. The important thing about the Phoenix is that uh, it is the only warmer now that is in the Kenyan market. That is zero withdrawal period in May. So this is a challenge that our dairy farmers have been facing. That uh, whenever they deworm their animals, they have to pour milk. You can imagine if your African cow is producing, let's say, 20 liters, and you have to pour milk today, tomorrow, and the day after. That's a loss of almost 60 liters. 60 liters, even if you are selling at 30 shillings, is almost 1,800 shillings. So this is really the game changer for the dairy farmers now that the uh, Aprinex is a dewormer that you deworm your cattle and you continue consuming or selling your milk because the milk withdrawal period is zero. This also gives additional uh, benefits to all the people who are in the daily value chain in terms of uh, safety, in terms of food safety, because uh, we know farmers have challenges following the withdrawal periods and it's very important now that we have brought them a molecule that is zero withdrawal period in milk. And again, uh, the, it, it makes the dairy farming uh, more pro, uh, profitable for the farmers. So that aspect in the, uh, for, for Aprinex also is that it's for treatment of all cattle in the farm. So you can use it to treat the heifers, the in calf uh, cattle. And now the focus is the lactating animals, as I said, because it's a uh, zero withdrawal period in milk. So you can see it is really a game changer for our country. We have already used this product in Kenya. It's also being used uh, by also the government of Uganda for control of external parasites and this kind of things. And uh, it's one of the really important molecules. So this uh, Aprinex is also a fine label from our distributor medicine. We have the one liter pack, we have the 2.5 liter pack. We are also working to introduce the quarter liter pack. And uh, the way of application is that it's a pour on. So you pour it along the back line of the cow from the withers to the tail head. And after pouring, it will spread on the skin and clear external parasites. It will also penetrate the skin through the hair follicle. To, it will also penetrate the skin through the hair follicle and actually be able to uh, get into the bloodstream and get into the internal uh, system of the animal and clear the internal parasites, especially lungworms and all the 
GIT worms. So that is the mode of application. It's a poor own application. You just uh, use an, uh, a dosing gun to apply or a syringe or anything that you use to measure. The one that also comes with a specific uh, measuring device, which is attached to the bottle. And just you pour, pour along the back line. And then uh, after several hours, it will have gone around the whole body. And after several hours, it will also have penetrated the skin and it will be a file in the blood and clearing the internal parasites. So I want to recommend this molecule, uh, Eprimex, to all veterinarians to give it a try. So many farms in our country have already used it. The benefits, uh, as I said, is zero with a period in milk. It's also really a new molecule, so it clears uh, the, the, the parasites that we know now that there, some, uh, there is some resistance by many parasites to have so there are many studies on that. So it will be able to really clear everything because it's a new molecule, and the farmer will see an increase in milk production. So that's one of the benefits. You will for sure see an increase in milk production in addition to the zero withdrawal period in milk, in addition also to the fact that it's poor on. And again, uh, this is uh, an over-the-counter product. You'll find it in many acrobats. You can also call directly Medicel Kenya Limited uh, and, ask, and ask them to supply directly to your farm, especially those who are practicing and covering many farms. Finally, I want to share the contacts of uh, Medicel Kenya Limited. <coughs> These are the contacts of uh, the colleagues working with Medicel. I don't know why my screen is having some scratches, but it's okay. So that's medicine, and that, that's a picture of the product. And these are the contacts of my colleagues. I want to thank all of you for your time. And just to, to recap, is that my focus today was on the uh, Epinex, and I've said it's available for Medicine Kenya Limited. And uh, it's a new product for control of external and internal parasites in our country. And we look forward to having additional trainings to you. But the availability of this product is just by calling the numbers that I've put on the screen. If you want to try it in your daily farm, if you want some of your farmers to try it, you just give us a call through the numbers I've put on the screen and we'll be able to deliver this product to your farm. And we'll be able also to give any advice with the farmers and yourself while you are using this product out in the field. Thank you so much for your time. I'd like to give uh, back to the the host. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kitur, for that presentation. So members, before we go to the Q&A, we are going to welcome Dr. Kamagi to make his presentation first, and then we'll take all the questions from for both speakers at a go. So I'll now welcome Dr. Kamagi. So Dr. Kitur, you will stop your screen sharing so that uh, Dr. Kamagi can share his screen and start off. Uh, just a recap for members, the, both presentations, you don't worry, will be shared to you, both the PowerPoints. So what you have to do is just to register your details on the link that we've, uh, that has been shared on the, on the chat box. So once you do that, the both presentations from Dr. Kamagi and also Dr. Kitur will be shared with you. Uh, also at this moment, if uh, kindly also remember to mute your mic as the presenter is uh, giving his presentation. We'll take all the questions at the end. And uh, just uh, clarity is that um, during the Q&A session, uh, what we'll request is that you'll just raise your, your hand. And then once your name is mentioned, then you can submit your question. So uh, welcome, Dr. Henry. Dr. Kar Dr. Kamagi Karibu Sana, uh, please, uh, you'll introduce yourself and then uh, you'll uh, start off. And welcome. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, I hope my video is. I hope my video is on as well. Is it? I can't see. I can't see anybody. So. Yes, we can see you. Okay. Yeah, and then don't All request right, so to make your presentation full screen. Full so you screen. Go under slideshow and then. Uh, slideshow. Whereabouts is that? Um, Top right. Guys, I'm trying Top to be. Right menu. Sorry? On your left pin, top right, left, go across. There's a. Go across again, again, there, then okay. from beginning. Far left. From beginning. Yes. Oh, 
Okay. Then proceed. Is that better now? Much better. All right. Um, I'm glad to have all of you on board. Uh, thank you for um, creating time for this. I know you guys have very, very busy schedules. Um, I have to start by saying good morning. Uh, is, yeah, good morning. Over here, uh, it's it's right now it's around uh, four minutes to 4.30 a.m. So, <laughs> so uh, it's pretty early in the morning over in New York. Uh, Kevin uh, Momani, thank you so much, Dr. Terry, for um, working tirelessly hard to um, make this presentation be a reality. So I'll start off today by uh, introducing us to what the subject of the day is. I have a bunch of slides to go through and um, I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, in between, um, uh, after a set of slides, I'll make a couple stops and take one or two questions before I proceed. And uh, um, uh, I hope that is going to be a smooth transition. So today we are going to be talking about elements of dairy milk quality standards. And uh, uh, as you can see on the screen, my name is Henry Kamagi. I'm a, a veterinarian, a dairy veterinarian, having been uh, uh, trained at the University of Nairobi, very proud of that. Um, uh, I do hold a master's of science and a master of public health from George Washington. And currently I'm a doctor of public health student at Capella University, um, specializing in infectious disease uh, control and doing another minor on health policy. So a little bit on infectious diseases and a little bit on the human side of health policy. So the scope of the presentation today uh, is going to um, be in the fashion of, I'll do a brief introduction or a brief background. Then um, I'll go to the significant elements of milk quality. And then finally, if I have some time, I'll touch a little bit on farm milk system. The way we organized this, uh, I'd intended that I touch on milk quality, then uh, over time, probably in the next presentation, uh, I'll be able to take us through how to conduct what is called an inspection of the dairy uh, system. If you went out as a veterinarian, if a farmer called you and said I have a milking system and, and, and you had to go out to inspect it, what are the various aspects of that system that you'll have the opportunity to inspect and how do you do that? Um, I'll start by giving a brief introduction to it if time allows me today, but then in a, a presentation that is coming up, again, um, I will be able to uh, solidify that and, and uh, we'll make an invitation to the same. So a brief background. Um, for the last 16 years, I've been practicing as a veterinarian, started off um, in the state of Indiana. All I've known in my veterinary career is working with dairy cows. And that's why I consider myself a dairy veterinarian. So started off as a veterinarian at that point, 2006. And then um, over time got uh, a privilege to be able to manage a bunch of dairy farms in the United States. Started off in the state of uh, Indiana. Uh, the first farm that I was in was around 1200 cows. Then um, went to another one after my contract ended, around 1500 cows. Then um, the last farm that I was in was around 10, around 10 to 11,000 cows. And uh, in all these places, um, uh, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I happened to be the only veterinarian. So there was just quite too much uh, 
to, to do some of you that were um, um, able to visit me or some of you that have been students interning under me can attest to the volume of work that we were able to, uh, to have. Now, because of that, perhaps I never took very, very good care of myself and I ended up um, uh, injuring my back. So I uh, suddenly started having paralysis on my legs. Uh, the doctors went through and realized that um, I had a, a severe uh, disc injury. So two of my discs were completely shot. I had to go in uh, exactly a year from uh, a year ago today. And I had a, 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 a surgery, some of you remember that. And uh, from that point, they fused my spine up and that's what made me retire from uh, vet practice at a very, very young age. So then I went into public health inspection when I came out of um, uh, hospital. And that's what I've been doing. I've been a public health inspector. Most people when they hear of public health inspection, they associate that with uh, somebody that goes into a hotel or a restaurant, walks into a bathroom or a toilet and decides that they are going to close the restaurant because they don't meet hygienic standards. That's not what I've been doing. I've been a public health inspector in the context of the dairy farms. So I'm a New York State certified public health inspector and I'll be going out and I inspect dairy farms just to make sure that they are compliant uh, with state and federal regulations. And part of that, uh, of course, when you're an inspector, you also have to be involved in shutting down or, or authorizing certain uh, uh, activities in, in farms. And the beauty with me doing it was, I was coming from the dairy industry, having practiced as a veterinarian, having managed dairy farms, and therefore I knew how um, things are hidden or how, how, how crafty people can be. So it has been a very, very exciting um, uh, experience. And um, I'm glad to announce here today that yesterday was my last day doing that. And I'm taking up on a new role that is more national uh, as a quality assurance um, uh, director with one of the um, uh, largest dairy companies in the United States. And I'm starting on that on Monday. So that's a good thing. So the reason why I decided to give this talk, and that's the reason why I also gave you that background, is because in the course of my 16 years and a half career in the dairy industry, I've noticed one thing, that Farmers, especially in the West, tend to be really, really protected when it comes to things about pricing of milk. Now, we don't have that at home because we have one single pair that is perhaps a monopoly. If Brookside, for example, approaches a farmer and says, we are going to pay you 20 shillings for every liter that we buy from you, that farmer basically has his hands tied. Why? Because he has no choice but to take what Brookside offers them. But how pleasant will it be if at all there was a national standard that the farmer can look at and say, you know what? You're going to buy my milk but the minimum that you have to pay me is going to be X amount of dollars. We don't have that at the time. Why? Because there is no pricing. There is no standard upon which pricing can be based. And that not only affects Africa, it affects other places in the West as well. So I'll start off because we are talking about milk. I'll start off by some of the most obvious things uh, about milk production. So I'll start by defining what is milk. It looks like it's a very, very easy question, but it's never so obvious. So what is milk? Now the basic street definition of milk, and I want us to take a few points home, is it is an opaque white fluid, rich 
in fat and protein. And listen to this, this is the kicker. Secreted by the female for the nourishment of their young. In other words, even in the streets, the basic reason why animals produce milk, the fundamental reason for that is for the nourishment of the young. So when Dr. Kamaki goes in and harvests that milk and drinks it or harvests it and sells it or both, we're already contravening what that basic street definition is. But I'll take us back to what people who write papers in this group normally do. When you write an abstract, at the bottom of the abstract, there is the portion that normally uh, uh, reads keywords. So today in this pre presentation, there are certain keywords that I want us to keep in mind. The first one is going to be what we call the PMO. And so what is the PMO? It is the pasteurized milk ordinance. That is like the Bible of the dairy industry. So how does that Bible, how does the PMO define milk? The PMO defines milk in the context of hooved animals. In other words, the PMO does not look at the definition of milk from the context of clawed animals. It looks at it from the hooved animals. If you went and captured a cheetah in the jungle, harvested milk from that cheetah, the PMO does not consider that to be milk. Why? Because you cannot take that, process it for the consumption of human beings. So the PMO, which is the basic underlying document that governs the dairy industry world over, defines milk as a normal lacteal secretion, practically free from colostrum, keywords, free from colostrum, and obtained from the complete milking of one or more healthy hooved animals. So what is the composition of milk? And you've had this time and again, time and again. Milk is majorly made of water. 85 to 87% or 87.5% of milk is water. And I want us to keep that at the back of our mind because it's going to be the stepping stone towards what I'm about to say in my next slide. About 3.5 to 3.7% of milk is made of fat. We also have around three to 3.1% of it being protein. And then we have lactose. I don't know what I can do about the side of the screen. Let me see that if I can move it around. So, okay, good. And then we have 0.7 to around 1% of milk being ash. Now, somebody asked me the other day when I was doing a teaching in a class, what ash is in milk? And this is the answer I gave. God forbid, if you died today and your wife decides that they're not going to bury you, they're going to cremate you. So what happens is they take you to the crematorium and they burn you and they tell your wife, come in tomorrow. What do they give her? They give her your ashes. So what does that mean? Ash is basically what is left when every water has been eliminated and every combustible part has been eliminated. That is what remains as ash. And that's the same definition of ash, even in the context of milk. When you completely dehydrate milk, then you take out every combustible part of milk, that becomes ash. And so that brings me to the second, um, uh, or rather, I don't know what number of slide this is. There are a few definitions that I want us to take home. Now, when we were in vet school, at the animal production department, there are a few of these things that came up and maybe they might not have made sense then, but I'll try to make it easier. Having defined the composition of milk as containing water, fat, protein, lactose, ash, 
And of course, we have other organic acids, enzymes, and vitamins. This is what I wanted to remember though. When you take all that and take away water, you end up with what is called total solids. So what is total solids in the context of milk? Is the composition of milk without the water. Now, if you get total solids and take out the fat part of it, now you have total solids without the fat. But there is nothing like total solids without the fat. Uh, let us just, let's mute. No, let's mute. Can we mute? Okay. So as I was saying, if you take the composition of milk and subtract the water, you end up with total solids. Now, if you take total solids and subtract the fats, now you end up with what is called total solids without the fats. But there is nothing like total solids without the fat. The correct word there, therefore, is solids non-fat. That is what that slide uh, basically says. So, what are the factors that influence the composition of milk? The first one being breed and genetics. All of us that have been in the dairy production know very well, and I know Kirini Spacho will agree with me. Breed is a major factor in the determination of the composition of milk. We all know that the Jersey breed does have the highest composition of butterfat and protein compared to the rest of the other breeds. So breed and genetics is, um, uh, is a factor. The environment of the animal, where the animal is, 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 is raised, that is a major factor as well. I live in the part of the United States that is extremely cold. I'm right by the border of US and Canada. So most of the year we are in very, very cold uh, uh, temperatures. A cow that is raised over here compared to a cow that is raised say in Texas, which is very, very warm, you'll find that the composition of butterfat, if they are the same breed, you'll find that the composition of butterfat of a cow in Texas is a little bit higher. Why? Because the cows in New York will take the fat and try to lay it under the skin for thermoregulation. They don't really mobilize that fat to the extent that you'll find it inside the milk. So the butterfat will be different in cows that are intemperate as compared to those that are in warmer climatic conditions. So environment is a factor. Feed, and those that are in nutrition will agree with me, that diets that are low in roughage or in excess short fiber will always result in reduced milk fat. Health is a factor, and of course the stage of lactation. Having with the dairy industry, I'll tell you cows that are always in the latter end of the lactation towards the end of the lactation normally tend to have a much higher somatic cell count. And of course, sometimes more prone to bacteria. Reason being, if you are milking these cows, there's so much um, uh, uh, physical insult to the other tissue to the very extent that there is excessive uh, proliferation of um, uh, inflammatory cell processes going on. And that sometimes reflects uh, 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 as higher somatic cell count uh, in these cows. So why does milk components, uh, 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 why do milk components matter? Milk component matter, and this is what I want us to take home again. Milk components matter because one, they determine milk prices. There is an economic importance to the dairy producer. And that's why we are having this discussion today. Because in my opinion, I think we need to revolutionize the dairy industry in whatever area we are, especially in the context of Kenya, to tie prices to certain factors that are not being considered at the moment. So pricing, is an important thing. Again, I will ask that whoever hasn't muted should mute so that um, I have a very uh, uh, a clear flow uh, of discussion. We will have some time to talk about uh, some of the things that we are talking about today. 
Now, for pricing, for pricing, milk quality is based on two main factors. It's based on volume. In other words, people or producers are going to be paid according to the volume of the milk that they sell. So if you provide 30,000 pounds of milk, so they use pounds and kilos. If you produce 30,000 pounds of milk, you're going to be paid according to that. So pricing in the context of milk quality is based on volume and it's also based on what is called premium components. What are some of the premium components? Butterfat, protein, somatic cell count, and the bacteria. And I want us to keep that in context. For pricing, again, I repeat, milk quality is based on volume, the amount of milk that the farmer sells, and it's also going to be based, or it's supposed to be based on premium components. And the premium components in this case are butterfat, protein, somatic cell count, and bacteria, four aspects. However, for somebody who has been a regulator like myself, when I go out there to make sure that farmers are compliant, I'm not interested in what they're being paid. As a regulator, mine is to make sure that they're producing this milk under the basic minimum conditions that are safe to the public. That is what regulatory aspects refer to. So there are two things here that I want us to differentiate. Components with regard to pricing and factors or quality factors that are important with regard to regulatory requirements. For regulatory requirements, as you can see, price is not a factor. Why? Because when I go out there, mine is to enforce the law. I'm not there to try to pay you money. I'm there to enforce the law that is already existent and to make sure that you as a farmer are producing that milk under the required set minimums by whatever jurisdiction. But whoever buys your milk, if you are Brookside and you're buying milk from a farmer, you are gonna be forced to pay the farmer on the basis of the pricing, which is volume and the premium components. And I want that to sink home. So for regulatory purposes, the three main factors that are important in quality are bacteria, somatic cell count, and antibiotics. And I will get into the details of these um, uh, in due course. So milk components of significance that again ties to the, to the pricing, are butterfat, and the butter prices normally determine what the butterfat prices are. Protein, and protein is normally determined by the price of cheese minus the value of the butter, and then somatic cell count. Now, somatic cell count differs depending on uh, whatever jurisdiction. If you are in Kenya, you can decide, okay, be it, Kenya Bureau of Standards or the Kenya Dairy Board, they can decide every milk, every drop of milk that comes within our border must meet this set level of somatic uh, cell count standards. Now, in the European Union, having been there for a while, I can tell you too, in the dairy industry, they have set their somatic cell count standards at 400,000. So if I am to import if I'm to export milk to uh, the European Union, then the somatic cell count has to be at least 400,000 and below. In the US, the leverage is bigger. It's around 750,000. So that differs according to the MMO. MMO is simply milk marketing organization. It's the country or jurisdiction 
that sits down and sets uh, what their standards are for somatic cell count. So in terms of components, butter fat, protein, and somatic cell count. So let's go to the next slide. Significant elements of milk quality. Today, the focus of my um, uh, um, presentation uh, is going to be on factors related to the regulatory elements only, not the pricing, regulatory elements. Because when you, my listener today, go out there, chances are you are not going there to be setting the price. Not many of us have the comfort of buying milk from a farmer to pay the farm. So there's a very, very high likelihood, and I'm very certain about this, that you'll be going there either to advise or to enforce some regulatory requirement once we've set the basic minimums. So the whole purpose of our discussion today is we will go out and starting to think, how can we reform our daily industry in such a way that how can we set the basic minimum regulatory requirements? Maybe we need to start this discussion with the Kenya Dairy Board, who knows? Maybe we need to start this discussion with the ministry, who knows? Maybe it is a discussion we need to start with the Kenya Bureau of Standards. I hope the name hasn't changed. When the, I left home, it was still KBS. I don't know if it, it has changed. Symbol of quality. So the focus today is going to be on the regulatory elements of milk quality. And there are two, rather not two, but three ways that we will approach this. One, I will look at the microbial aspects of milk quality. Then I will get into the somatic cell count and mastitis aspect of milk quality from a regulatory standpoint. Then lastly, I will look at the drug residue testing for milk quality. Three things that we are going to be focusing on today, and that's where uh, our discussion is going to be centered. Microbial aspect, somatic cell count, and drug residue. Remember I said, there is the Bible that is used in the milk industry. It is called the pasteurized milk ordinance. So according to the PMO, for regulatory purposes, in any consecutive six month duration, and that's a brief background. This discussion today is to equip us with what is expected. So when we start this discussion, about how to set minimum standards in the dairy industry. We are doing it from a point of knowledge as professionals. So according to the PMO, which basically regulates the dairy industry world over, in any consecutive six month duration, at least four samples from the producer will be tested for bacteria, somatic cell count and antibiotics. I'll explain what that point means. For regulation purposes, if you have a producer known as Mr. Kamau, the farmer, you need to have at least four samples tested for bacteria, somatic cell count and antibiotics in a period of six months. Now, how do you determine the, regu uh, rather the regularity, how often you collect those samples? That's gonna be up to you. Because it is so difficult, a place like United States, for example, has decided to hell with the four months, we're gonna test every month because it says at least, so it means we can test every month and, be, and have six samples. Because then how are you going to determine which four samples you're going to use? So to hell with that, let's just have one common way of doing it. We will say every month, we will test one producer sample and it will be uh, tested for bacteria, somatic cell count and antibiotics. Remember, those are the only three important things when it comes to the regulatory aspects of milk quality. So how do you test? If I decide that I have to go to farm A and pick a sample, how are you supposed to pick a sample? Do I go and just pick it from a tank 
if the tank has a lid on top, if I just open the lid and dip my dipper there and, and get that, there are minimum requirements on how to pick a milk sample. In the United States, one of the things before you get in the dairy industry, you are not even allowed to start practicing and touching milk before you take a course on sampling and get a license to sample milk. Not anybody can go in and sample milk. The right, well, anybody can go in, but we are talking about doing it right. So this is how you sample milk. When you get into a farm, you will agitate that tank for five minutes. Now, what does agitation mean? If you get to a place where there is a milk tank, according to the correct architectural design of a milk tank, every milk tank needs to have what is called an agitator. An agitator is just like a mixer that goes around. It just chants the milk. Reason being, cold milk should not be sitting still. It needs to be agitated because many times, not so many tanks have coolers in them. The systems that we see today use what we call um, a heat exchange system where milk passes through what is called a plate cooler. It comes out very cold and it goes and stays in the tank. The tank many times doesn't have a cooling system. When milk sits cold, especially if that tank is out, chances are you'll have a lot of sedimentation. So most tanks are designed to have an agitator. So you go in there, agitate that tank for five minutes, then at the tank outlet, you need to take a sample, what we call an aseptic sample. Those that are veterinarians in this forum today know how to take a sample midstream. Now, if that tank is more than a thousand gallons in capacity, you cannot just agitate it for five minutes. You need to go a little longer because of volume issues. So you go 10, 10, um, 10 minutes for that. Then with that, you have to include what is called the COC, which is the chain of custody document. Now the chain of custody document, I'll define what that is. It makes no sense. In the aspect of management, having been a manager, a manager I can tell you, if you don't write it down, it doesn't exist. So you can go and pick up a milk sample and do it absolutely right. But if there is no chain of custody document that shows how much milk was in the tank by the time you are sampling, what the temperature of that milk was, and what your initials are, because we want to know who did that that it makes, makes no sense. So chain of custody document is important. It will show, among other things, the volume. For tanks that have stick readings, you'll find um, uh, certain tanks normally have like a stick that um, has graduations. So you have to dip that stick inside the, the, the milk, of course disinfected, put it inside the milk and then you'll read the level of the milk and then it converts into volume. You have to write the stick reading if that tank has a stick reading. You have to write the temperature. Why? Because this sample is going to be tested for bacteria. We want to know that whatever bacteria levels that will be tested are not as a result of the fact that the milk was warm for way too long after you picked it up from the farmer. In other words, we want to make sure that whatever you pick is the direct representation of what actually goes on at the farm. So chain of custody document is important. When I go out to inspect, and I did this a lot, how I used to nail truck drivers, I will show up and notice, I take time and I see what time milk is normally picked up on the farm. If I want to nail a truck driver, I show up and notice, a pack somewhere at the corner. And when I'm sure he started pumping the milk into his truck, I show up and I simply ask him, can I see your documents? Chain of custody document. Many times they don't have it. He's gone smoking cigarettes outside while milk is pumping. And then he'll take the last bit of milk and write that as a chain of custody. And that's how you lose your license right there. 
chain of custody document has to be done when you pick up the sample. Not when you've pumped the milk into the truck, when you pick up the sample. The other thing that you have to pick up is called a TC or a temperature control. When you pick a sample, pick a temperature control. Why do we need a temperature control? Whenever this sample gets to the plant or to the factory where that milk is supposed to go, they are going to be testing for the temperature. How do they do that? They stick a thermometer in there. How do we know that, temp that thermometer is clean? We don't know. So you don't want to stick that thermometer in the real sample that is going to be tested for regulatory purposes. That has to be tested on a sample that we say, you know, we can use wherever, in whichever way we want, and we call it a temperature control. So you just write TC, and now you have two samples, the real sample and the temperature control. So let me get into the deep things of today's discussion. I said for regulatory purposes, I'll keep on repeating this for the rest of our discussion. We will be talking about the antimicro rather the microbial aspect or the bacteria aspect. I'll be talking about the somatic cell count and the antibiotics. So let me start with the microbial aspect or the bacteria aspect of milk quality. And to start us off, I'd like to give us a little bit of a historical perspective. Microorganisms in milk and dairy products are a concern for several reasons. First, for public health reasons, we want to make sure that whatever milk is consumed by the public is clean. So that's why we are involved. For regulatory reasons, that's why microorganisms in milk and dairy products are a concern. They're also a concern for regulatory reasons. Remember I said, regulatory reasons have nothing. We don't care about the price. The, whoever buys the milk from you can be completely milking you dry and paying you nothing and we will not care. We want to care that milk is being produced under the minimum requirement by whatever jurisdiction, be it a country, be it Kenya Dairy Board, be it uh, uh, Kenya Bureau of Standards. And we went to make sure that Brookside is following the regulations in paying you. We don't care how much they pay you, but we want to make sure that they are at least following the regulations. So for regulatory reasons, uh, milk uh, microorganisms are very, very important. And for product quality, in the world we live in now, most dairy companies really care about that UHT milk, ultra heat treated milk that is on the shelf, their greatest number one priority is how long can we make that shelf life be? So for shelf life reasons or for quality reasons, microorganisms are important. And lastly, for YEPI, maybe somebody is asking what is YEPI? Because of the young, the elderly, the pregnant, and the immunocompromised. We have them in our society and we have to protect, protect them. Now, as part of our historical perspective, pasteurization is a method that has been used to critically reduce um, uh, illnesses related to dairy and dairy products. However, in the recent past, a lot of milk outbreaks have been observed. As a matter of fact, most of the infections, most of the infections um, that result from unpasteurized milk are linked to campylobacteriosis as a result of campylobacter jejuni. That is unpasteurized milk. If you take milk and just take it without pasteurization, most of those infections Studies have, studies have shown they are as a result of campylobacteriosis. And the organism implement, uh, implicated in this is campylobacter jejuni. Now for pasteurized milk and milk products, the incriminated microorganism has been the norovirus. So pasteurization as 
originally intended was targeted at the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis. So what is pasteurization? I know this might have been mentioned, you've read it on milk packets, but do we really know what pasteurization of milk is? If you take milk, and I'll try to make it simple, and towards the end of this, I will take us through how to do pasteurization. Leave alone these big names that I use. We will be able to see how we can pasteurize milk in our own setting, lab setup pasteurization. We call it lab pasteurization counts. What is pasteurization? You can do pasteurization using two ways. You heat that milk rapidly to 63 degrees Celsius and then hold it at that temperature for 30 minutes. Then rapidly cool it. Or if you wanna do it at a shorter time, what we call ultra pasteurization, you can go in and increase the temperature and make it 72 degrees Celsius in just 15 minutes and then rapidly cool it. That is what pasteurization is. Now the secret to this, heating milk to 63 is not the big deal. The big deal is heating it to 63 and holding it at 63 for 30 minutes or at 72 for 15 minutes. That is where these systems, when you walk into a milk manufacturing company, that's where these milk systems come in. The manufacturing companies normally struggle a lot when it comes to maintaining that. And when I go out to inspect a dairy company, that's one thing that I look at. So I got trained as a veterinarian. I'm coming out as a little bit of an engineer. I want to see how you can maintain that temperature. If you cannot convince me that you can hold that milk at 63, then you cannot also convince me that you are correctly pasteurizing that milk. And as a public health inspector, I can nail you for that. If you can prove that to me using very, very clear empirical ways. So in the 1950s, remember the target was originally tuberculosis. But then again in the 50s, they started realizing that they were dealing with another different microorganism, and that was Coxiella banetti. So they decided to increase that temperature in order to knock Coxiella uh, banetti out of, the, um, out of the, the milk. I don't know what has happened to my screen. Um, there you go. Let me see. Okay. Fine. So let us go into the meat and the muscles of our today's discussion. We are, we are delving deep and I, I hope I'm not losing anybody yet. I keep on referring to the PMO, okay? So according to the pasteurized milk ordinance, there are two main ways of determining and reporting bacterial counts in milk. Get this, I'm not talking about bacterial counts in general. Today, our context of discussion is with regard to milk. So microbiologists in the room, you will spare me a little bit because today's discussion is all about, all about milk. So we started, and I want you to stay with me, three things, bacteria, somatic cell count, and antibiotics. We started off with bacteria, and we decided to give a historical perspective to it. And now we are getting deep into how do we determine for regulatory purposes, bacterial count standards in milk. So according to the PMO, the way to determine and report bacterial counts in milk is two prong. The first one is known as the standard methods. In fact, um, uh, when you dig deep into, in, in, into daily uh, bacteriology, the actual book that is set for determining how to conduct tests regarding milk, the book itself is actually called the standard methods book. So the first way of determining bacteria counts and reporting 
for regulatory purposes is the standard metals. And what are some of the standard metals? The standard metals can be divided into two. One, you can do what is called SPC, what is referred to as standard plate count. Now, when people hear standard plate count, the first thing that comes uh, in their mind is petri film and the, uh, rather, rather the, the petri dishes because that's what we were taught in vet school to be the plates. But according to milk regulations, standard plate count does not necessarily mean uh, a, a petri dish. It is just a word that is used to mean direct plating. You take a milk sample and you plate it. You can either plate it on what we call a petri film, and I will show you what a petri film is. And some of this, uh, uh, I took one year to make this um, uh, presentation. Uh, and therefore, I have videos uh, of me doing some of these procedures. I also have photos that I've taken the last span of one year when I determined that, you know, uh, um, uh, this is what I'm interested in doing. Then I started documenting some of these things from a lab perspective, especially after uh, I got out of uh, field work uh, following my surgery. So I was just mostly involved in lab work. So I did a lot of that in the last one year. So standard plate count simply means you are directly plating the milk on a plate. It could be the petri film, which I will show you, or a disc. The other way to do it is by use of modern technology and the machine that is used in the current times. I don't know if there is any in Kenya right now. It's called a Bactoscan. I'm going to show you what a Bactoscan is. It literally takes the milk and I will show you a video of how it works and you get results. It literally counts individual bacteria in the milk and in nine minutes, you have the counts. So colonies on uh, standard plate count agar, and just for shits and giggles, any bacteria work, if you do any bacteria work, the conditions for that are as follows. It has to be incubated for 32 plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius for at least 48 hours under aerobic condition. In other words, just put it there. And then uh, that is standard plate count. Just plate the milk, be it in a petri dish or be it in a petri film, incubate for 32, uh, at 32 plus or minus 0.5 degrees for 48 hours and then come and read how many colonies you have. And then the other way of doing it is by way of a Bactoscan. Now a Bactoscan uses what is called a flow cytometry and it counts individual bacteria. Like I said, it pops out um, uh, the number of bacteria in a milk sample uh, in nine minutes. I got the privilege of getting my licensing in Bactoscan and it was one of the hardest things before, be, rather, other than by, uh, uh, going through vet school, one of the other hard things that I had to do was to get my license in Bactoscan. It's a very, very complex one, but uh, um, a very interesting machine to run. So let me go in to, to see, I don't know why I, my, okay. So this is a picture of what a petrol film is. That's the lab that I, I, I was working in uh, until yesterday. On the left hand side of the screen, you can see what a petri film is. Now, you can use that. You simply, are you guys able to see my arrow? I hope so. You can come and inoculate your milk sample right on that. Oh, damn. How do I go back? Okay. Yeah, you can inoculate that, the milk sample in there directly, or you can use what is called, uh, uh, and this picture here, the second picture was taken when I was right in the middle of plating. And as you can see, the Bunsen burner is on, so you can see the flame, but it was on. Use what is called a plate loop, which is them that are used to carrying syringes around. It is simply a syringe 
a tube and you have um, uh, autoclaved water so it is free from bacteria and it has a very thin loop. You buy this from the company and this loop is able to do uh, uh, one to 1000 dilution of milk. And I will tell you something. Let me just stop at that point and tell you something about dilution. If you suspect that whatever product you are going to inoculate inside here is supposed to give you, under normal circumstances, a lot of bacteria, then you need to dilute even further. So in other words, if I go in and take bottled water that I bought from the store, that bottled water is not supposed to have bacteria in it. So I can just go in and use a dilution of one to 10, one to 10, because you don't expect to have a lot of growth. However, if I pick a milk sample, for example, or I take a saliva sample, for example, I cannot use a one to 10 dilution because you'll have this thing so full of bacteria, you'll not be able to count anything. So you dilute it further. You might have to go to one to 1000 dilution. And in other areas, in the medical field, they actually sometimes go to one to 10,000 dilution. In the milk industry, we try to confine ourselves to either one to 10, one to 100, or one to 1,000 dilution. This particular plate loop specifically does one to 1,000 dilution. And this is how it works. On the farthest end of the screen, uh, I took this still photo when I was literally sampling the milk. You simply dip it three times. The regulation requires that you dip it three times and then you press this plunger and you have a deposit of a sample there. You release the cover, you simply drop the cover and you go and incubate that, like I said, for 32, at 32 degrees Celsius, plus or minus five degrees Celsius for 48 hours at least. And that is um, uh, how it's done. You come and put it inside an incubator. This is a picture of an incubator. And um, uh, because this is a regulatory lab, we have to keep a temperature regulation in there. So this, this uh, thermometer simply tells us that the temperature of the incubator is maintained at where it's supposed to be. If you look well, uh, you'll see that actually it shows, um, it shows, you know, that it was around 32 over there. So you put the pit of films in there, 32 degrees Celsius plus or minus uh, um, 0.5 for 48 hours. And then when you take it out, this is what you'll be having. You are looking at a plate, a petri film that has colonies growing. And you can see how many colonies here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Any dot on that plate is a colony. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six colonies, but help me out. We used a dilution of one to 1,000. So what that tells me is six colonies translate into 6,000 colony forming units of bacteria. That's what it means. If I used a 10, one to 10 dilution, six colonies will result to, the reported count will be 60. I multiply it by my dilution. If it was 10, it is gonna be 60. If I use a dilution of one to 100, it's going to be 600. If I use a delusion, like in this case, I use a delusion of one to 1,000, it's going to be 6,000. I hope that is clear. Now that's um, a little bit of uh, uh, a photo of what I was doing in there. I was using different petrol films over here. There are different manufacturers produce different petrol films. They can produce petrol films for coliforms, then they can also produce just for ordinary standard plate counts. So I want you guys to watch that video.
the whole purpose of this video is to show you how, how to inoculate a bit of film. Dr. Kamangi, since I think they can't hear the sound, you could be explaining as the video is playing. Oh, oh they there. can't hear the sound? Yeah. Okay, but I, let, them, let them just watch that and then I'll explain. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm sorry you guys were not able to hear um, anything. Is it because they are muted or, or what? Kevin? Yeah, I think it's, it could be the, the sound output from the video itself. They were not able to hear that? Is it because they are muted? No, not really. Okay, so let me explain. Uh, and I really feel bad because I really intended uh, that everybody could hear, hear this. I don't know what I can do to, uh, to, to get the sound out, but let me explain. What you saw happening there was a demonstration of how you inoculate milk uh, uh, on a petri film. I used water for demonstration, but if it was milk, that is how you are supposed to inoculate. You simply open the petri film, use what is called an electronic pipetta, or you can use a glass pipetta if you don't have an electronic one. I was lucky to have an electronic one and that's what I used. And you simply inoculate it. And then you roll down the leaf and you go and incubate it. So this next video shows how a bactoscan actually works. Remember we said there are two ways of determining bacteria, standard plate count, and you can use a bacto scan. And a bacto scan is here. Now, the lady that operates this is uh, my former co-worker. You'll see a little bit of her finger here and there. Uh, was, uh, that's not me, that's her. So when you see Qtex, that's not me, that's her. So watch what a bacto scan is able to do and how that machine works. Milk, Bactoscan requires that milk has to be between zero to 4.5 degrees Celsius before you test. In other words, that's the temperature of the milk before it gets into the machine. So that's how it works. Uh, you can see barcodes. So these are the numbers of the farm, farms that we have. Every farm has a number, we code them. And then that green is a laser that just reads the barcode. And the first thing over here is called the star. It simply just mixes up the, um, uh, the milk. And then the second one is the sampler. And look at that. Look at this. It produces outputs. And you can see there's an ID of the farm. And it tells me what the individual bacterial count is, and then it does a conversion into what that coliform forming unit is. So in other words, this column is not important to me at all. The most important column in bacteriology is the colony forming unit. So for farm 2904, it had 1,000 bacteria. These numbers are in thousands. For farm 3980, it had 4,000 bacteria. And I'm able to see that in a matter of nine minutes. So that's how this system works. At the end of the day, in one hour, that machine can run at least 150 uh, um, uh, um, uh, farms. So it also tells me the date. 
and what time it was run. And so that is what, what happens, I don't know, okay. Now this other one just shows you the internal structure of the Bacto scan. And I'll play it, there is a rack over here Underneath that rack, there is a belt that drives this, it's a continuous drive belt. So the rack continues to move on. And then this portion will, um, Amy, my colleague is going to open it up so that you see the internal structure of this. It takes the milk, this one over here stars it, and then there is a sampler over there, takes the milk, runs it through the system, incubates it, mimics the 48 hour incubation in a matter of minutes and pops out the result uh, like we saw uh, on the screen. So that's the internal structure of the scan. We have so many valves. Um, divides that milk into several areas, but this is the most important part. It's called an acu well. Picks up the milk and incubates it inside this well. Uh, um, mimics the 48 hour period that that milk should have been in the incubator. So this is like the incubator um, um, over here and it does it in minutes. And then it passes it through a laser uh, passes it through a laser. I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. There you go, so this is a laser. And this laser shoots a beam and the milk passes through one single stream and it counts the individual bacterial count. And that's what comes on the screen as IBC, individual bacterial count. And the computer converts that into colony forming units on the screen. Okay. So that was the first method of determining bacteria uh, um, uh, uh, quality. One, we said we had the standard methods and the standard methods we said we can do standard plate counts. And I showed you how to do the standard plate counts using Petri films. And you can also use the Bactoscan, which is the modern way and runs so many samples within a short time. The other way is the most obvious ones, and is the most obvious one, and we call it the alternative method. I call it the alternative method. So what are the alternative uh, uh, methods? Uh, uh, what are some of the alternative methods of, of, of doing this? One, you can do what is called the PI. What is PI? PI is an abbreviation for preliminary incubation. What that means, and I want you to stay with me. We already did standard plate count. We already did back to scan. Let's see, you'll see a lot, when you read a lot of daily literature, you'll see these words, and I'd like to take time to explain them. Preliminary incubation simply means you are doing incubation before you can inoculate that milk on a petrol film. Now, preliminary incubation is a method that is meant to isolate bacteria that can grow in refrigeration temperatures. In other words, you want to make sure that you have provided the ideal refrigeration temperatures for bacteria that are supposed to grow under refrigeration to grow. And you do that by doing preliminary incubation. Remember, ideally milk for testing for bacteria is supposed to be between zero and 4.5 degrees. Anything beyond that, when milk is above 4.5 degrees Celsius, you should not 
And I repeat, you should not test it for any bacteria. Number one. Number two, if that milk has stayed for over 48 hours, you should not test it for bacteria. So PIs simply mean that you are taking the milk and preliminarily incubating it and providing the conditions necessary for bacteria to grow under refrigeration. And what that does is it provides the environment for bacteria that thrive under refrigeration to grow. So how do you do it? You take a milk sample, put it inside an incubator. That incubator has to be around 13 degrees Celsius for 18 hours. And then the following day, take it out, put it in a refrigerator or ice cold water and let the temperature fall to between zero and 4.5. Because like I said, you cannot do bacteriology. You cannot inoculate when the temperature is above 4.5. So after it has been 13 degrees Celsius, then put it into iced water so that it is at a temperature where it can be inoculated in a petri film. Then inoculate like we just did on standard plate count for 32, uh, for, uh, uh, for 48 hours at 32 plus or minus 0.5 degrees. So that is what preliminary incubation or PI, when you see this in the papers, PIs are just for um, uh, getting bacteria that thrive. Now, bacteria that thrive under these refrigeration temperatures are referred to as cyclo, uh, uh, cyclotolerant bacteria. So the other way of looking at it, PI is a method for isolating cyclotolerant bacteria. You just in, um, incubate for 13, uh, uh, at 13 degrees Celsius for 18 hours, then inoculate using standard plate count like we did uh, on the petri film, uh, and that's how you do it. The other way of uh, uh, determining bacteria in milk, you can, and you've seen this in most of the papers, is the LPC, which is the lab pasteurization count. Now, lab pasteurization count simply means you are doing pasteurization in a lab environment. And this is done in order to isolate thermoduric bacteria. What are thermoduric bacteria? Thermoduric bacteria are those bacteria that can strive under pasteurization temperatures. Now, milk manufacturing companies are very, very interested in this test over here, LPCs. Because if bacteria can survive pasteurization, then you really are in problems. Ideally, most milk products, when you do an LPC on them, you should not be having any growth at all if pasteurization actually worked. And that is one way as an inspector. If I walk in, to a factory that manufactures milk and I want to make sure that the pasteurization process is okay. I go in and I sample the milk using the method I showed you. Then I go and quickly run an LPC. If bacteria grows, then I know there is a problem. So cyclotolerant bacteria are mostly going to be gram negatives, but thermodurics are mostly going to be gram positives, okay? So if you get cyclotolerant bacteria in your PIs, then you know there is a problem in the cooling system. It means if you have bacteria growing and there is cooling temperature there, it means that there is a problem with the cooling system. And now we are talking about how to diagnose problems when you see them, be it on a farm or at the, uh, 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 at the farm level, or at the industry level. At the farm level, if you want to know there is a problem with the cooling system, the farmer calls you and says, oh, my samples have been coming up with very, very high bacteria counts. What do I do? If you want to rule out cooling, the first thing you want to do is run a PI because that will provide a good environment for bacteria to grow under refrigeration. Then you know the cooling has a problem.
if the bacteria is high, but the PI is very low, then you know, the problem is not with the cooling. There is a different problem somewhere. Maybe it's coming from the cows. But for lab pasteurization, which is for thermodurics, if you find you are isolating bacteria, most times it is because you have dirty equipment or dirty cows. And many times you are dealing with bacteria that can withstand pasteurization. They normally have, you know, an extra layer over them. Most of them are gonna be bacilli uh, in nature. The other count that you can perform is the coliform count. And that, that name is pretty obvious. How do you do the coliform count? There are specific petri films that are just for coliforms. You simply inoculate them there. And the beauty with the coliform count, this is the only bacterial test that you don't have to wait for 48 hours to get a result. Coliform counts are only 24 hours. Put them in and you'll find coliforms growing on that petri film. The petri films for coliforms are normally pink in color because they're impregnated by a special medium known as uh, uh, the brilliant violet red uh, medium. So that is specific for the isolation of the coliform count. Then of course, lastly, you can simply smear it on a slide and do uh, direct microscopy. So this is how, a picture of how you do lab pasteurization. And this is a picture of how I did uh, lab pasteurization, pasteurization just last week. Um, I had a set of samples. I have um, um, a, a, a water bath. And this water bath, I have a temperature, uh, a device, which is a thermometer that goes in to take the temperature of the water. And it is sick. Before I put samples in there, I made sure it's 63 and it is holding at 63. How do I know that? It has a regulator. If it is lower than 63, then I just increase it to get the temperature. So this is how you do lab pasteurization. You make sure that your temperature, the temperature of the water is at 63 and it is holding. The most important part about pasteurization is you want to make sure that you have that constant temperature and it can hold for 30 minutes or you can take it to 72 and it can hold for 15 minutes. And I have a timer here. If you look well, the timer is already set at 30 minutes. So I'm gonna do the, uh, uh, the slow pasteurization, lab pasteurization, which takes 30 minutes, okay? Um, uh, sorry. Then on the bottom, oh, what am I doing? Okay, on the bottom end over here, um, uh, um, I don't know if you can see it, but the bottom end shows um, my, are you able, are you guys able to see everything or it's, it's cut out? Are you, able, are you guys able to see the bottom, the bottom yes. um, images? Or yes, no? yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. So the bottom left you can see is um, my agar. It is inside that thing that looks like a sufuria because most standard plate agars are frozen. So you have to throw them out. When I wake up a stove and just heat them until it melts out. It melts out. And then once it's in liquid form, then you can use it. Now for standard plate count, I decided because petri films are very expensive, I decided to use uh, petri dishes because I can make this agar myself in the lab. So I made it uh, in order to avoid using petri films just out of economic reasons. And then in the middle part, you can see the plate loop that I use for standard, um, for, 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 for plating that. Now, when you look at the tip of that um, uh, um, uh, a plate loop, you can see that the loop is bigger. You buy it from the factory and they have already measured and determined that when you take a milk sample on that loop, it's going to be one to 10 dilution or one to 100. Peter films, are on the right hand side. And of course that was my working space. And then this is my petri film after I've already inoculated my sample and poured uh, um, uh, the poured the, the agar. I inoculated and poured the agar and you can see uh, how it is on the plate. 
and that agar outside the heat, it solidifies. In less than a minute, it completely solidifies. And then you put it inside the incubator. And as you might remember from basic microbiology, when you do Petri films, you put them upside down in the incubator. The reason for that is normally you have water of condensation forming on top of the lid of the petrol dishes. So you don't want that water to drop into the, uh, uh, into the medium. You want that water to be uh, remaining on the surface. So you put them upside down so it doesn't interfere with the medium and whatever you are putting in there. And again, put them in the incubator, 32 degrees plus or minus 0.5 and wait for 48 hours. And the farthest end, you can see the result. I put this under a magnifying glass. Um, we call it um, a, a plate reader. And it is just a magnifying glass with the light underneath it. And you can see on this one here, we have two counts. We have two colonies. And I used a dilution of one to 100. So two means 200 colonies. That's what it means. You can see what I was saying. When you do a pasteurized lab test or a lab pasteurization test, you don't expect to see a lot of bacteria. This is just way too much. I picked this specifically so that I could give this illustration. Ideally, most milk that you find in the shelf will not have any growth at all. But I just picked this because I wanted to use it for the demonstration purposes. Um, for coliform count, remember we talked of coliform count as one of the alternative metals. I said the pit film is, is purple in color. And this is a, a picture of having inoculated, I just used water in this one, but ideally it will be milk. And you simply drop that and put it in an incubator. And then the last thing you can do, you can use direct microscopy. You simply smear it on a, on, on a slide and then you go and read. Now, if you are a regulator, like my case, you are required by the government to go in for eye testing. Uh, I have an eye challenge. I have, my left eye is not the same as my right eye in terms of the equity. So what happens is that um, every six months I have to go in to be tested so that they are sure that what I'm reading is actually what I'm seeing. It is very possible to look inside. We used to make a joke in, in, in vet school that you can have the best stethoscope, but if your ears are full of otitis externa, it doesn't matter how accurate your stethoscope is, you won't hear anything. The same applies to microscopy. You can have the best microscope, but if you don't know what you're looking at, or if you don't know um, what to look at, or if your eyes, like Kamagis are kind of messed up, then you will always be giving farmers the wrong answer. They want to make sure that as a regulator, your eyes are always checked and you take that into account when you're reading this. When you read that, you multiply it by a factor of the power of your eyes. So like me, I know the power of my eyes from the last test I did was 4430. So whatever I read over here, I multiply it by 4430. That's how compromised my eyes are. That's how they do it. But the whole purpose of this was to show that you can do direct microscopy and count bacteria. You'll see chains of bacteria, you'll see streptococci, you'll see staphs, you'll see a lot of uh, bacteria formations inside there. Now, if you do a coliform count, this is what you'll see. This is now the colonies and you can see these are coliforms. All you need to do is to count this and multiply by the factor of your dilution. In this case, I used a dilution of one to 10. So whatever I get over, if it is 100, I multiply that by a 10 colonies to give me 1,000 for my official reported count there. For regulatory standards, if you are doing regulatory work, a producer raw milk or milk that you pick from the farm, the bacteria levels should be less than or equal to 100,000 per ml on standard plate count. 
Now, standard plate count should not scare anybody now. It means it's a big name for nothing. It simply means taking milk and inoculating inside a petri film or inoculating inside a petri dish. It is called standard plate count. If you inoculate milk for regulatory purposes, a producer milk or a milk from the farm should be 100,000 or less. If it is commingled milk, what do I mean by commingled milk? If I go to farm A, let's say I have a big truck for transporting milk. I go to farm A, I pick 20,000 gallons of milk. I go to farm B, I pick 40,000 gallons of milk. The truck does not have a compartment that separates farm A and farm B. All this milk is going to be put all together. In Luo, we say manuanda. So what happens is you have this milk from two sources all commingled. If you have commingled milk for regulatory purposes, you are allowed a higher exception. You can go up to 300,000 or less. If it is from one farm, it is 100,000 or less. If it is commingled milk, it is 300,000 or less on standard plate count. But this is where the game gets interesting. For premium standard, remember, I said for regulation, we don't care how much you get paid. But let's say we wanted to care about how much a farmer is paid for quality of milk that they ship. Remember we talked of for prices, farmers are going to be paid on the basis of volume and premium quality on the basis of butterfat, protein, somatic cell count and bacteria. So let's say I want to pay a farmer some premium for producing high quality milk. If you decide to go that direction, your premium should not go anywhere beyond 10,000. That's for regulatory purposes. We say, okay, you can pay the farmers all you want, but if you are going to pay them for quality, that milk should be 10,000 or less on bacteria on standard plate count. For industrial purposes, that is pasteurized milk, they're allowed up to 20,000. So Brookside, if you go, I don't know what brand of milk there is on the shelf right now, Tuzo. The time I last Kenya, there was Tuzo. If you take Tuzo, that is pasteurized milk. If you go ahead and inoculate it, you are still allowed regulatorily to have up to 20,000 uh, um, uh, SPCs per ml or less. And like I said, for regulatory standards, this is only tested once. You can't go to a farm and pick a milk sample today, test and it, it tests 400,000 and then you come back the following day, pick another sample and now it tests 100 and you want to use that for regulatory. No, it is the one test per month. Whatever test you pick, that is what is going to be used for regulatory purposes for the month. I hope um, I'm, I'm clear on that. Thank you, um, Dr. Pamanda. Yes. I'm looking just at the time. Eh? Yes. We have like 10 minutes to go. Okay. Good. Thank you for that reminder. Now, we also have the uh, somatic cell count. Remember, we talk of the bacteria aspect. We also have the somatic cell count aspect of milk quality. Now, somatic cell count is important because it is tied to mastitis. It is more of an immune response of bacterial in invasion into the udder of an animal. And most times, 98% of intramammary infections occur when pathogens invade the mammary gland through the uh, teeth orifice. Now, we have significant microbes in the etiology of bovine mastitis. We have the contagious forms uh, of mastitis. We also have the environmental forms, opportunistic forms, and we also have what is rarely mentioned of a milking, which causes damage to the teeth ends. You end up with liner slips. Liner slips are those rubber uh, parts of the milking system that completely get in contact with the teeth of a cow. If you have vacuum issues in the milking system, then you can have liner slips and that will always 
cause a spike in the somatic cell count. And you also have contagious uh, forms of, of transmission. Now, somatic cells are there for the next line of defense and an indicator of mastitis, okay? When you're talking of somatic cell counts, now the white blood cells are the most incriminated in this. They proliferate the, 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 the quarter and under normal circumstances, <clears throat> any uninfected quarter, if you take milk from a cow that is not infected, most times the somatic cell count will be less than 200,000. For legal limits, remember we talked of somatic cell counts being determined by the jurisdiction. Kenya can have its somatic cell count limits different from the US, different from Canada. That is set by the jurisdiction. Now, in the US, I say it, it is 750. For Canada, it is 500,000. I think in the, U, uh, in the EU, it is 400,000 per ml. An average healthy quarter should be having right about 70,000 somatic cell counts. But remember, if it is uninfected, it is going to be in the range of less than 200,000. But the ideal quarter is around 70. Thousand. When you start having counts that are two to three hundred thousand, then you know there is a problem. That is an indicator of a potential infection. So, how do you determine somatic cell count? You can do that um, because remember, we tied somatic cell counts to mastitis. We have two ways you can use a biplate or a triplate, that will give you. Um, uh, an indication of uh, the bacteria that grows. Now, this portion over here, I'll use the triplate and, and completely ignore the biplate. This is normally blood agar. Some people call it factor. Most bacteria will grow on blood agar. So when I have growth on blood agar, it actually tells me nothing. However, if I have growth with hemolysis on blood agar, then we are starting to talk. We are talking of staff areas of them. Now, this pale area over here on a triplate is normally McConkey agar. From vet school microbiology, McConkey is specific for E. coli and for coliforms, E. coli being one of them. So if I have growth on McConkey agar, what that tells me is that I'm dealing with a gram negative, most times a coliform. So how do I know it is E. coli and not Klebsiella, which are both E. coli, which are both coliforms rather, excuse me. How will I know, how do I, will I differentiate? E. coli on McConkey will give you some very bright, very bright, uh, uh, publish um, a kind of colonies. They have a shiny surface and then anything else will be uh, um, uh, any other coliform. But E. coli grow very, very beautifully on McConkey. This agar, uh, this uh, medium over here is called modified TKT agar. It is specific for the isolation of streptococcus bacteria. So what this means is if I have growth in this medium over here, I know I'm dealing with strep. If I have growth on this medium over here, I know I'm dealing with a gram positive, but I don't know exactly what it is. However, if I want to know whether it is a gram positive staff or a strep, the difference will be for a strep, I'll have growth here and growth on MTKT because this is specific for streptococcus. So if I don't have growth over here, but I have growth on blood agar, chances are I'm dealing with a staphylococcal bacteria. Now, you can also determine somatic cell count using direct microscopy, and that's what we call direct microscopic somatic cell count. And you can also uh, have a combi machine, which is basically like the back to scan machine. It's only that, uh, sorry, it's only that um, uh, it is specific for counting um, uh, 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 somatic cell 
cows. So this is an example of um, uh, a hypothetical uh, premium program that I just drew up. If we are to set up a quality program, say for Kenya, we can set up something as easy as this. Level one, if we want to pay farmers, we say, your for, if you want to get the first premium pay of say $10, your bacteria has to be that. This is just an example. I'm not saying this is the standard. This is just an example. This is going to be your bacteria, your somatic cell count has to be that, and then we're going to pay you that. And we can say, maybe for tire two, it's going to be, maybe your bacteria has to be that, that, and that's going to be the price. This is how you set up a premium payment. And remember, we don't care about payment for regulation. We only care about the standards when it comes to uh, regulation. The last thing, remember we were talking about for regulation, we talk about bacteria, we talk about somatic cell count. So I have already mentioned bacteria, I've mentioned somatic cell count, and the last bit is about drug residue. How do you test for antibiotics uh, uh, in milk? I want us to realize that milk from one cow that is treated by around, um, uh, with around 100,000 international units of penicillin may be detected in a herd of about 1,000. In other words, the commonest assumption, and I used to do this a lot when I was in the dairy industry. You are like, okay, I'm going to have 1,200 cows milking today. So what that means is I can inject one cow with 30 cc of penicillin and by dilution, that is not going to show up in milk. And those are the little assumptions that result in the problem we have all over the world today of antimicrobial resistance. Because we give way too much leeway to the use of antibiotics in a very careless manner, in a very callous way, and it hurts the industry as a whole. So there are two main ways of testing for drugs in the dairy industry. You can use what we call the inhibitor assays, and the most common method that is used today is the DELVO. Now the DELVO, this is the picture of what a DELVO uh, uh, pack looks like. You simply take off the golden foil, and then there are tablets in here. You place these tablets in the foil, or rather in the, in the, in the wells in here, and then you inoculate around 250 microliters inside each well. There are pipettes that are, uh, are graduated for 250 microliters. And then you put it in an incubator for two and a half hours. That incubator must be around 64.5 to 65 degrees Celsius for two and a half hours. When you come out with your sample, you are supposed to um, uh, have a result. If you have a purple, like this one over here, it means a positive. There are two ways. This is, you can use a block or you can use uh, one that uses a tube like this. This is the same simple, uh, um, um, they're both Delvo methods. Most of you have read about Delvo. If you put your tablet and you inoculate 250 microliters, incubate for 65, uh, at 65 for two and a half hours. When you come out with your results, if you find it is purple, then purple P means positive. If it is negative, this is going to be yellow. That is how a DELVO is interpreted. A DELVO test for antibiotics is interpreted as P for purple and Y for not found or negative. The correct term to use when relaying antibiotic uh, uh, results is not negative. You use the term not found. That is what you report. I repeat, not negative. The answer is not found. The second way of doing it is using immunoassays. And probably you guys have seen this, this um, uh, uh, being marketed by IDEX. I have some IDEX um, employees uh, uh, on the forum right now. You simply 
what you do, uh, I'll just take you through uh, how, how a snap works. This is the kit for a snap. It comes with two tubes. Those tubes go in these holes over here. You inoculate 450 microliters. When you buy this, it comes with a pipetta, which is 400 microliters. You pick a sample of milk that you want to sample, put in that tube and place inside the hole. So this is a, a block heater. It is heated. I have a thermometer. It's supposed to be 64. And just bear with me. I'm almost finishing. So you take this, number one or number two, you place it on the block to start heating. Meanwhile, you have the tube in here. Say you had two samples that you wanted to test. So the sample for tube one goes in here. The sample in tube two goes in here and you have the corresponding blocks um, in here. You let it stay on the block, 64 degrees Celsius for around five minutes. That's how you do it. And this can be done at the farm, five minutes. Once the five minutes elapse, you take what was in the tube and pour inside this well. When you pour it inside the well, you will start seeing milk moving by capillary action. And this is where most people get it wrong. The very moment the capillary action, this is normally blue in color. This part over here is blue in color. The very moment that capillary action starts getting into the part over here, you need to snap. You press that portion, you press this snap area with your finger all the way to the bottom. That's why it's called a snap kit. The very moment you snap it, you wait for four minutes. So the whole idea, I put 10 minutes over here, but the snap test is actually nine minutes long. Five minutes to incubate it at 64. Then you pour it in the well and watch the milk move by capillary action. The very moment this blue coloring in the well in this hole over here starts disappearing, you snap and wait for four, four minutes. When you snap it, the current modern tests come with a reader. You simply put it inside the reader and it will tell you whether it is positive or negative. If you don't have the reader, then this kit here, how to interpret it is, this is normally called, this portion of it, there are two dots as you can see. This is called the control pot and this is called the sample. The control should not turn, should not have a color change. In other words, if you put, if you snap after four minutes and you find that the control area, which is to the right of the big pot, if it is darker than the left side, the only reason that will make the control be dark is when you have antibiotics. So if this, as you can see on this snap number two, this is darker, this means that is positive. If the control is lighter in color, which is supposed to be the indicator of no antibiotics, then it means it is negative. And like I said, there's nothing like negative when you're reporting it, you say not found. So summary of what I was talking about today, for raw producer milk, the required tests are standard plate counts. You can do pre, uh, um, pasteurized lab, counts, you can also do antibiotics. If you are receiving a truck, and maybe I didn't get time to explain that, all you need to do is the antibiotics and detect the temperature, that doesn't matter. But what is important is one, I don't know, my slides are not correctly numbered, this is one, two, three. Number, what is important is number one and number three, raw milk and the pasteurized milk, because that, those are the ones that um, affect our system. And I will end my presentation today at that because as I was beginning, I did mention that I will only get into the farm milking system if time allows. And as I timed myself exactly two hours, it was all about quality today. The next webinar that we are going to have, and I prefer we have it on a weekend because I'm starting on a new job on Tuesday and I don't want to start taking off on a weekday to do it, they will not allow me. It's, a, it's, it's not a, a very good way to start 
<laughs> work at a new place. We will start looking at farm milk cyst. This is a very important one. How to diagnose aspects of the wash system in a farm, what the CIP requirements are. What CIP means is just cleaning process, okay? What the design of a wash system is, and then how can you analyze? Can you walk in a farm that has a milking system installed and analyze the components of that? And then finally, I will take us through how do you conduct an inspection of a farm? So far, what we have learned today is the factors that govern regulation, how regulation works. If we are going outside there to start a conversation, be it with the dairy board, be it with the Kenya Bureau of Standards, we now know what the tools we need to have in our bag are, okay? And then we will move next time to the milking system at the farm level, what the milking system is supposed to look like. When you walk in and you look at a milking system, right away you should be able to tell whether it was designed right or wrong. And then I will help us understand how to do an inspection of a farm and that is going to mark the end of our series of lectures. So the next lecture, stay uh, um, um, uh, on the lookout. The next webinar is going to be farm milking systems and how to inspect a milking system and how to inspect a farm. Why will I do that? Because I'm a farm inspector and therefore I think I have a little bit of knowledge on how this is done. So we will share that in our next webinar. Um, over and above that, I want to hand over the meeting to Kevo. Thank you so much for your participation. I can see we had 147 participants. I didn't envision that it was going to be large, a large crowd as this. Thank you for your audience. Thank you for giving me your ear and your attention. I hand over for a, a Q&A session. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Kamagi. That was awesome. Actually, we hit 175 at some point, and it's actually very, very encouraging to see that we are still at almost 147 to this time. So we'll take some questions. So as we said, you we'll just raise your hand, but we'll start off with questions that were that were sent through the chat box. So we'll start with the Dr. Nazaria's question, which was around in relation to milk. Just what's the on. difference? Uh, Yes. Can, can, can I, uh, let me get off the slide so that I'm able to see uh, uh, okay. what we have on it. How do I do that? Uh, on stop. the chat box. Stop but sharing. I recorded them for you. So it will be oh, okay. okay. So okay. stop sharing with you. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just take you through the questions since I already wrote them. So the first one was about uh, from Dr. Nazaria. In relation to milk, what's the difference between milk quality and milk safety? Awesome. Great, great question. In fact, that was one of the questions I was asked when I went for the interview for the job I'm starting on Tuesday. Uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, uh, directors asked me, so Kamagi, uh, can you tell us the difference between milk quality and milk safety? And I'll tell you exactly how I answered that. Based on my understanding, milk quality has to do with the factors that govern regulation and the factors that govern pricing. Milk safety, on the other hand, will be with regard to those factors that threaten the safe production of milk right from the cow end to the consumer end. It could be terror reasons, but we are in the era of bioterror, where somebody can walk in with a whole tin of E. coli, simply drop it inside a tank of milk, it goes out into consumption, and we have a coliform um, uh, um, 
uh, kind of infection in large. So quality is about setting standards. I'm going out to be a quality assurance manager. What you do is in quality assurance, you know what is the expected, you know where you are, and you want to decide how you're going to bridge that gap. That is what quality is about. How do you set the protocols that govern the industry? Some aspects of quality can affect safety. But if I have to dichotomize the two, safety is purely about how to present that milk from the farm to the consumer in the most unadulterated manner. So yes, there are certain aspects of quality that can affect safety. For example, we talked of three aspects of quality today for regulatory purposes. We talked of bacteria being one of them. If you screw up bacteria aspect of quality, then you are compromising safety. We also talked about somatic cell count. If you screw up somatic cell count, then that translates into mastitis and that also translates into safety. What is now the big thing in the world of medicine is antimicrobial resistance other than coronavirus, antimicrobial resistance. If you don't take care of AB resistance by presenting milk that is laced with antimicrobial agents full of penicillin and tetracycline or sulfonamide compounds, then you are also compromising on safety. There are two separate things but they are interrelated. Okay, thank you so much, Kamagi, for that. Uh, Ruben Soy, I can see your hand is up. So I'm just going to unmute you. Or are you able to unmute yourself so that you can ask a question? Ruben Soy, are you able to unmute yourself? You can type down there if it's not able to pick up. Okay. Then there's one with 671104. Please ask your question. Thank you so much, everybody. This is a wonderful presentation and looking forward for the next one. My question is. Uh, of hatcheries in big farms here in Kenya, uh, complaining that uh, the guys are complaining that they have you know, antibiotic residue in the milk, and uh, being sure that they have not and they have not used antibiotic for 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 the safety. Uh, for example, yesterday I had a case of a farm in Nyeri uh, producing about fifteen hundred liters that have been returned because of antibiotic residue and they are very very sure and honest i'm assuming that they have not used antibiotics for the last two to three weeks what what are the what are the what are the issues that can bring such results in milk thank you um, okay. i love thank that you. question because when i go out to do inspections some of the farms that i inspect are organic farms now, what are organic farms? Organic farms are farms that, and I'm coming to your question, are farms that go by the tag, we don't use antibiotics. Our farms are organic, they're grass fed and whatnot. And that's a big thing in America. People want to be getting milk from grass fed. We don't want, because there is a lot of politics that has gone into antimicrobial resistance that there's so much trash out there about the use of antibiotics. If you are a veterinarian, you have animal rights activists that are like, no, you guys are injuring animals with the needles and you, you, it's a whole mess. And one of the greatest problems I run into when I go inspecting organic farms is you walk in there, this is a farm that is not supposed to be having antibiotics. They go by, 
zero antibiotics and they are being paid more money because they don't use antibiotics and their animals are grass fed. What happens is many times you go in, you open one cupboard and you find a bottle of penicillin G with a, a syringe stuck in there. Now, uh, you walk to the farmer and ask the farmer, so this, this, is, this is organic. How did this antibiotic end up on this farm? And then they give you this stupid look like, no, no there's nothing like that. This is an organic farm. There is no reason why there should be a bottle of antibiotics. So what I normally do as an inspector, I don't have to find you injecting a cow. The very moment I find a bottle on the farm, that's it. Back to your question. Why are we having cases like that? Two things. Either somebody used antibiotics there without the knowledge of the farmer, and this will occur in farms where you have farm managers that go behind the farmer when they see something, and the assumption is what I talked about when I was talking about an, uh, antibiotic resistance. They're assuming, ah, it's just one cow, and this 150, it's going to be diluted in the volume. Then it doesn't get diluted then you have a positive case. That is the first culprit. The other thing could be, what method are they using? And this is why we are having this discussion today. We have to have a national standardized method of testing for antibiotics. I'm sure if you went to that farmer and asked them, how did they test this? Uh, we, we, used, we used the SNAP method. Okay, who told you that the SNAP method that you're using is the recommended one. Is it expired? Is the kit expired? Did you do it right? So we can't blame the farmer all the time. We also have to go back to the point of what test method was used and who validated that test method? Who validated? And this is what will happen. That is what happens when you have a monopoly in the dairy industry. When one company say Brookside, and I have no problem with Brookside, I'm just using that as an example. If you have one company as Brookside buying all the milk and they're saying, we are going to pay you for the volume, but we're also going to pay you for zero antibiotics. And we are the ones who are going to test your milk. How do you know that they are not the ones that are sabotaging the farmer? How do you know that? But you cannot even take them to court or take them to account. The reason is, what are you going to base it on? We have no standard of basing our arguments. And that's why we are having this discussion so that we know how we can go and start the discussion. Kenyans, my fellow friends and colleagues, we have to have a standardized way of regulating the dairy industry in Kenya. Otherwise, we are wasting time. Farmers are getting denied what their rights are. We have a single pair that sits down and decides how the quality of your milk is, yet he's the same person that is paying you the money. He's the same person testing your milk. He can decide to sabotage you and there's nothing you can do because you are stranded. He is the only one that can buy that milk. If he says your milk is bad, your milk is bad. So we have to set up regulatory authorities. So those are some of the... So, a, a, a major factor will be a major factor will be adulteration at the level of the farm, but I don't see that happening much. It has to do mostly with uh, um, the testing method. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kamagi, for that. So we'll take. I think we'll take two more questions because of time, and then we'll in there. Someone this is what I will suggest, Kevo. Um, at the end of the time, if there are people that are still interested in going on for Q and A, you can officially user, you know, please yeah. unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Did you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm waiting for user. 
Are you there? You can un unmute yourself and then ask your question. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yes, I, 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 for me, I just wanted to make a, a remark uh, that at the start of the presentation, there's one issue that came out that we as the extension services provider, we commonly meet this question from farmers. The factors that determines the quality of milk. And for me, I think it was a learning process because most of the time we know we only peg it to the breed and the genetics. And we commonly talk about the breed and give list of like jerseys will give you high quality milk, come down to fresh yarn, and then there's an aspect of quantity. And I think today's, today's presentation has built our knowledge as extension service provider on what are the extra factors that we basically don't know that influences the quality of milk, especially the butterfat content. Or another thing, the reason why I was asking if there is somebody from the Kenya Dairy Board, I wanted to know, is there a plan from the Kenya Dairy Board, now that they are the current regulator in this sector, to bring up regulations to ensure that farmers going forward will be paid on the quality of milk and not on the quantity? Because this will actually, this aspect of paying on the quantity is denying farmers their rightful uh, income. We have farmers like in Karen who specializes in jersey productions. The, the, their milk is basically from jersey and the butterfat content they get from that milk is very high. However, when they take them to the processors, it's only about the quantity. Is there a plan if there's somebody from the Kenya Dairy Board to tell us if there's a plan that soon we will see farmers being paid on the quantity, on the, on the quality? That is what was my concern. Otherwise, thank you, Dr. Kamagi, for the nice presentation. I hope next time you program better so that we go through all the presentation. We feel, still want to hear what is remaining on the other aspects of this presentation. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pacho. Um, I think for the, for the purpose of today's presentation, just to start off, uh, piggyback on what you just said, for today's presentation, I think I covered everything that I'd intended to cover. What I didn't cover was the milk systems. And that initially, I wanted to introduce it if I had the time, but that was going to be a rushed up introduction. That's part of the second presentation. But to just um, touch a little bit on what you just said. When we were in primary school or whatever level of education it is, if you never had incentives, everybody's in class, but you want to improve quality by providing incentives. You say, we are going to provide scholarships. So people compete. If you don't peg milk quality pricing to components, then you have denied the farmers the ability to compete for quality. Nobody has any incentive to produce clean milk. They'll be like, all we need to do is work a maziwa kwando. Nobody will care whether that milk has manure in it. Nobody will care whether there's a work a maziwa kwando. But if you provide incentives in the form of let's pay them, uh, let's pay them um, uh, on the basis of, of uh, 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 um, you know, quality, then you introduce healthy competition and that is good. So I don't know if there's anybody from KDB over here that can um, uh, 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 comment on what uh, 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 Pacho, my friend, has, has said. Yes, uh, we are from KDB. Uh, Come closer, closer to the screen, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm uh, Emerson from Kenya Dairy Board. Yeah. And uh, uh, for, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kamagi for that presentation. It was quite interesting. On the issue of quality based payments, yes, incentives are important for driving the dairy sector forward. And as a board, what we've done in the current regulations, which are currently in discussion, is to introduce an element of pricing that will be based on components. And that is the process that we are working towards with the key processors to see how best that is going to be done. In fact, some of it has been implemented by the processors. Bio, for example, is doing that, and uh, others are coming up to take up that process. And it's a process that we are seeing is going forward in terms of improving quality for marketed meat. So yes, there are regulations that are going to come up that are going to uh, advocate for quality-based 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Evanson, for that for that wonderful um, uh, uh, response. At least we are stepping in the right direction. So what that means, therefore, is once the KDB has this solidified, then we are going to start, they're going to start holding these people that are paying the farmers to account on how they are reciprocating the farmers for their quality. And I think that's a step in the right direction. Pass my regards to KDB when you go back, sir. Okay, yep. thank you so much, Kamagi, and thank you so much uh, uh, for the representative from KDB for giving his, uh, Evanso for giving your feedback into this session. So I think we'll check just one last question because I'm seeing there's a hand from Ruben who had initially raised his hand. Can he now unmute himself? And then from there, I will invite our chairperson to give some comments. That's uh, Dr. Nicholas Miale, and then we'll cross the session. Ruben, can you hear us? Well, I think Ruben, is unable to mute or are you able to speak? Ruben? Okay, so I'll take that Ruben is not able to talk, but in case he comes on board, you can ask his question. So now for this moment, I welcome Dr. Nicholas Miale to give just a closing remark and then we'll, maybe before Nicholas comes in, uh, Henry, would you like to give your last parting words? Yeah, um, like I said, man, we've started the conversation. It's gonna take you, it's gonna take me. Uh, I look forward to part B of this presentation. Uh, 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 I have to sincerely thank uh, Dr. Momani, uh, uh, the Kenya Veterinary Association for going out of their way to make this uh, a reality. We had some challenges but uh, at the end of the day, the end justifies the means. And I'm very, very grateful uh, that um, each of you uh, made time to come here today. I look forward to seeing you uh, in the next presentation. Uh, I'm glad I even pulled this. I'm not feeling very, very well. I had, a, I, had a, <laughs> I had a COVID test yesterday. I'm waiting for the results. I'm actually on quarantine. So, <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, this is really good for a quarantine presentation. So um, thank you guys so much. I look forward to seeing you guys in the, uh, in the next presentation. And, uh, um, and uh, it was worth waking up at four to give it. Okay, thank you so much yeah. to Dr. Kamagi for sparing your time to really present to us. So Dr. Nicholas. Okay. Yeah, please proceed, thank you. Um, I hope I can be seen because I can't see on the screen. Yes, we can see you. Yeah, I, I want to, to, to first thank Dr. Kamangi for provoking this debate. It was, uh, it was his own initiative. And um, the idea came from the veteran and the WhatsApp group. So we can see knowledge is not limited to conferences only. And um, we've had challenges to have this uh, proceeding and uh, I hope uh, in, in the, 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 the coming one will not have the same challenges. I want to say that uh, it has not been easy to have this uh, presentation. Many might not know that it has not been easy, but we, uh, we were determined to have it because we, people were ready to learn and to, the learning was promised. It was not promised on on, on the premise of CPD points. So those who are asking for CPD points, we, we will still try to pursue if we can get the points. And that's why we are asking you to register to give your name at the end of the this session. We'll try to pursue the points if we manage to get well and good. If we don't, at the end of the day, we learn. And that was the objective of this meeting. I want also to thank uh, Dr. Joseph Kipkemoi Kitur for having uh, actually been uh, supportive he, he came through to to support us in terms of uh, sponsorship and uh boringa is really supportive and we want to have other players support us like uh, i can see we, we had the kenya dairy board present next time we will actually bring them on board as uh, sponsor so that they can 
the given time and even make a presentation. We want to have a collaborative uh, learning going forward, involving all the veterinary surgeons and veterinary professionals. We want to engage our experts both within the country and outside the country, and we'll use any available platform. We don't really have to pass through CBD points. We want people to learn and to grow in their knowledge. And, and, and uh, please don't uh, feel bad that you won't get points. I think you, the knowledge that you've gotten is really priceless. Personally, I've learned a lot of things. I'm not a dairy person, but I've learned a lot. I can even be able to inspect in quotes a farm. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm very grateful even for KVA. KVA, we initially we wanted to, to host this Zoom on our platform, but we've had some issues which I can't disclose right now because they are more of uh, management than, uh, than for public consumption. And I thank Kamagi for being understanding. I thank uh, Mamani for being innovative enough and going all this way to ensure that this event takes place today. I'm very grateful to all participants. You've graced the day. I can see the numbers are still 121, and that is very encouraging. We are looking forward to maybe having an event of 500 plus because we'll publicize it and we'll give enough time to, for people to register and even participate. Others, thank you all for coming. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Dr. Kamagi, I'm aware you really went a long way to make this possible. And we are looking forward again to have another presentation. So everyone who onboarded, kindly have a blessed afternoon. And sorry for that uh, little extension. OK, so Koherini Namkwe na good afternoon. Thank mm -hmm. you.